Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, I didn't get a lot of pushback on my uh, five Mount Rushmore greatest figures in jazz history. <clears throat> I think in part because it's a pretty unassailable five quintet. Uh, their impacts are all fairly unequivocal and uh, change the face of jazz forever. And one last comment on the Miles thing. My criticism of Miles isn't generally a criticism of Miles as much as it's a criticism of the post-Miles media having elevated him beyond his place. There's a hindsight that miscalculates Miles' place in the canon. And that's not really Miles' fault. I'm sure he played into it to some degree and was willing to take credit often for things that he knew he wasn't really the engine behind that drove it. But, I mean, a lot of this seems to have happened post-Miles. And a lot of it, I think, is just strictly due to the fact that Columbia Records, the most powerful record label in the world, owned the rights to so much of his catalog that they kept his name in lights. And that really elevates his <clears throat> uh, posthumous shadow. He just looms over jazz. And like Marley does to, to, to reggae, Miles Davis really is just infinitely large in the jazz landscape. And, I mean, deservedly so in many aspects, but there is some dynamic to that that does seem unjust and brushes aside so much of the accomplishments of the rest of the jazz universe. And I say that because, myself included, it's fairly common for jazz collectors, especially early on in their journey, to have 12 Miles Davis records and 40 jazz records. I think that's a fairly common development. I mean, we come to jazz through Miles so often, <clears throat> excuse me, through Bitches Brew and through uh, the fusion stuff and the elevation of the, the second quintet and I mean just those box sets that constantly get pushed out and Herbie Hancock's career, Wayne Shorter's career so just to see, see Ron Carter and so I mean there's so many link, linkages and lineages to, to Miles' career that so again it's not really a critique of Miles I don't think Miles ever positioned himself to be the greatest trumpet player of all time and I don't think he ever thought of himself that in fact I'm sure he didn't I'm sure his insecurity, uh, which drove a lot of his behaviors and actions, had him quite well versed in how inferior he was to much of uh, the skilled set. Freddie Hubbard, he wasn't. Clifford Brown, he wasn't. Louis Armstrong, he wasn't. Dizzy Gillespie, he wasn't. I mean, there's a lot of guys, Booker Little came along and just could blow a horn. Uh, and so. <clears throat> But let's not diminish in any way the greatness of Miles' accomplishments. And some of his missteps even are noteworthy. The hip-hop stuff, doo-bop, and uh, I mean, it's the Cindy Lauper time after time. It's, it's actually a great version of that. I really enjoy Miles' take on time after time. Uh, and un unequivocally, his uh, hard bop era with the quit with the Coltrane first quintet, to me is his <clears throat> zenith. I don't think he really uh, was ever. I don't want to say on the cusp of the edge because I mean that group was right there behind Miles Davis. I mean, sorry, Clifford Brown, Max Roach. It was right there behind our Blakey, Horace Silver, Jazz Messengers. That Miles Coltrane quintet was definitely a part of that uh, crest of hard bop, that post bebop movement with more melodic push and more groove and less uh, frivolity and less just plain virtuosity and, and embellishment. It was much more rooted back in the roots of what jazz was. And of course, that second quintet, as great as it is, I think very clearly from my perspective, that's a Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock driven phenomenon. And it's certainly worthy of Miles' name, like he deserves credit for putting that group together. But I mean, 
I have often said it often feels like he's kind of holding on by the coattails while these young guys are delving into the new landscapes of jazz, sonic, and sound. And Miles is a bit like, oh, shit, hold on, guys. And those albums are actually quite incredible. Uh, I think they're a little bit more difficult and less accessible to the common person, whereas a lot of that prestige Miles, I think, is very accessible to most anybody. And I like some of Miles' early work, to be honest. I mean, some of that early stuff on prestige where he hasn't quite defined who he is yet. There's some interesting stuff in there, but let's move on. Today what I'm going to do is, again, we're going to do a list, in part because I'm working on a lot of original music right now, so I haven't been listening to as much jazz. I have a few things I could show you, but I'm kind of actually not going to do that today. I'm going to give you a, a second five for a top ten. And again, lists are arbitrary. Lists are kind of silly. Lists are kind of ridiculous. But lists also drive viewership and also help people kind of have a starting place to jazz and to come on into the fold. And so, I mean, even on my last list, uh, five was Miles, but the, the top four, Monk, Parker, uh, Armstrong, and Ellington, are really interchangeable. You could really put the, any four of those in any order you wanted. And I wouldn't have an issue with any one of those four being elevated to the top position or being reduced down a step. But I think they're pretty clearly the top four guys. And I've had that notion for a number of years where they those four have been my Mount Rushmore. So it wasn't like I just came to that conclusion putting that episode together and kind of in a rush sensibility. It's something that for a long time my perceptions from all the liner notes and reading and reviews and influences by other musicians. I mean, it's, for me it's pretty clear those four guys are really elevated in terms of their importance above. And it's not to say there's so many guys that are still absolutely a, a notable mention and, and uh, honorable mention. I mean, R. Tatum, obviously, as my friend Bill Stevenson mentioned, was a huge impact on bebop and a huge impact on what was happening in the landscape of Charlie Parker, even. Uh, R. Tatum's impact's pretty unequivocal, and he might be the greatest virtuoso in jazz history. I mean, Tatum's playing is quite dynamic, and uh, a lot of it was some of the inspiration to Parker's revelations into bebop. But, uh, I mean, Dizzy Gillespie obviously deserves a lot of recognition. I mentioned last episode, Count Basie's legacy. But that being said, I'm going to jump into my next five guys who I think are the next five most influential and important, revered by fellow musicians. And not all was collected as they should be today, I think, but I still think this is a strong next group of five. And, I mean, there's so many names, like, you're omitting here but number five six sorry is Clifford Brown <clears throat> and Clifford Brown his star shone very bright for the little time that it was illuminated and when it was put out it was a great loss for jazz when he, when he had a car crash early in 56 <clears throat> and uh, his sober living lifestyle his wonderful clear tone his punctuation his rhythmic propulsion, his long lyrical lines that were acrobatic and well-versed and lyrical, yet incredibly acrobatic and incredibly like a roller coaster at times of sound and equal tonality. And a lot of guys will run out of breath towards the end of a phrase. Clifford's phrasing just seems to be effortless and so eloquent and just beautiful at any tempo. Whether we're talking Clifford Brown with Strings on Emercy or the great quintet stuff with Max Roach and Harold Land and uh, Powell, Richie Powell and uh, <clears throat> company. I mean, it's, it's really unrivaled, Clifford Brown's acrobatics, dynamics, propulsion. <clears throat> the only trumpet player who I think has some of that same... <clears throat> and without, with less... I don't want to say soul, but I mean, how Freddie Hubbard was an incredibly dynamic guy. I mean, there's other infinite guys that you can say can play, but Clifford Brown, man, his impact and the impact of that quintet with Max Roach and company was really broad in terms of how it was reshaping the jazz landscape. And you don't have to read too many liner notes before you recognize the impact that this group out of Chicago, out of Emerson, was having on jazz around the country. 
And I think some of those sessions were actually recorded on the West Coast, even though they were released on Emerson out of Chicago. <coughs> but uh, the talent at Emerson, Mercury, was pretty unrivaled. The uh, tenacity of that group, the aggression, the... Uh, I mean, I think pretty clearly to me, along with the Jazz Messengers, they are really the ascension uh, and the invention of hard bop. And I think Clifford Brown's really the guy who codifies that and re reintroduces the stating of the theme and, and giving you a verse of melody that lets you know what context we're in, whereas bebop went right to the frenetics and the <clears throat> inventing new melody and ignoring stating the melody of the theme of the song. I mean, Bebop didn't really care. They just used the chords and said, this is just a framework, and we're going to just jump through hoops and snakes and ladders and end up where we end up. Whereas with Hardbop, we once again stated the theme of a song, gave you that context. And then the tempos were still there, and the aggression was still there, and the tenacity was still there. The grit was still there. And the grit's really what separates Hardbop from Coolbot. That West Coast Coolbop stuff, those guys can play, but there's a grit that's missing which <clears throat> comes from driving a convertible to work. I mean, those West Coast cats, most of who were white, made better money, recorded for better labels, had better education, had better touring opportunities. So they all lived a better lifestyle than being black in America. And we can never escape that context. It's, it's ever-present, it's omnipresent, it's <clears throat> omniscient in all aspects of what jazz is about. It has to be always acknowledged and said ad nauseum. And some people get tired of me talking about it, but too fucking bad. This is what makes this music this music. And <clears throat> it's the same message that comes across in early hip-hop. It's the same message that comes across in the Marvin Gaye's and Stevie Wonder's and uh, Curtis Mayfield's in the 70s. I mean, it, this was just that version of that message pre-civil rights. It's coming out loud and clear post-war in hard bop and bebop and into the free and the avant-garde jazz movement, there's a whole social consciousness in jazz that's at the cutting edge of the civil rights movement. And it's not something that you can separate or detach from listening to the music. If you're listening to it and not hearing <clears throat> the, the Watts and Detroit and Newark riots, and you're not hearing the social conflict and the, the struggle of being black in America and your chance of being arrested or being exposed to drugs or becoming a hustler, you're not listening to the music. You're absolutely missing all of it. And I think so many people who are uh, jazz literati, the snobbish element, are just thinking that it's about virtuosity and sophistication and how ele elevated they are in their own social status. They're so divine. And go fuck yourselves. You're fucking pretentious. This music is about struggle. This music is about joy in spite of pain. As Frank Beverly once said, joy and pain. Like sunshine and rain, baby. It's it's absolutely omnipresent in this music. So Clifford Brown's impact is just so dramatic, and it's felt not just in trumpet players. And that's, again, what the Parkers, the Monks, the Ellingtons, the Armstrongs, those guys all didn't just impact their instrument. They impacted the entire face of the music, which is what really separates them from most of their other contemporaries. After Parker, everybody wanted to play like Parker. After Armstrong, everybody wanted to play like Armstrong. After Monk, space and modernity and avant-garde and edges and dissonance became a language that was spoken far more fluently and commonly. And of course, Ellington always had tinges of dissonance in his music. But Monk took it a step further. Monk delved deeper into it. Monk had more of that Picasso minimalism and more open spaces. And with Ellington, you have a much bigger group, so there's always some kind of sound in the background on top of that dissonance or, or chords that are washing through. With Monk, it's such a minimal group often that, I mean, you listen to Monk by himself. <clears throat> That's a treat. There's few piano players that are more indulgent in terms of just listening to how powerful a creative force they are than Thelonious Monk by himself. I like a lot of piano players, and I can listen to them in trio settings, duo settings, solo settings, but Monk is Monk in all settings. Big band to, by himself. He's just a, an incredible force. And so those four guys, like I said, you just really can't assail their place in the list. And again, Clifford Brown impacted all players after he after he arrived on the scene. Everybody was like, wow, this is the new voice. And you read liner note after liner note after liner note. 
<clears throat> that are recognizing the ascension of this young Clifford Brown and how he's going to be the voice and the future of jazz. And uh, I, you, you, you hate to use the term the next great hope, but I think he was definitely seen as a messianic figure, a figure that could really propel jazz into the next decades and constantly re-innovate and reinvigorate uh, a, a genre that was stagnating and lost its audience. And his, his passing was just a devastating blow to the jazz community. And when that word trickled around and it spread like wildfire through the jazz community, the, the, the talk of the devastation from everyone who uh, I've ever heard comment on it, everyone knew what a loss that was going to be for jazz. And so Clifford Brown, in a way, only stretches the surface of what Clifford Brown probably his impact could have been. Where would Clifford have gone in 65? Where would Clifford have been in 76? I mean, it just boggles the mind to contemplate. But a, a loss, we never really got that opportunity. But it's uh, still wonderful to think about it and, and to delve into that kind of a, a, a mindset at times. Uh, number seven on my list is the aforementioned Art Blakey. And you'd really be amiss to not mention Horace Silver here at the same time. Because those two, again, were the Blue Note sound. And the Blue Note sound is 56 to 59, hard bop at Blue Note. That's what the Blue Note sound is. When you read that phrase somewhere, the Blue Note sound, it's not talking about Herbie Hancock's Imperial Island. And as great as those records are, and as great as some of the avant-garde stuff, and some of the, the, the different stuff that comes out on, on Blue Note later, the Boogaloo even, I mean, and the Blue Boogaloo did become a Blue Note sound as well in, in a lot of senses. But the Blue Note sound is the hard bops out of the early, mid, late 50s. And Blakey Silver just really drove that home. And the entire lineage and, and uh, roster of the hard bop stable and canon is Jazz Messenger alumni. Your Donald Byrd, your Curtis Fuller's, your Hank Mobley's, Lee Morgan's. It just goes down the list. Bobby Timmons. I mean, it's just an incredible roster of artists <clears throat> that Blakey continually propulsed out into the world and out of his bands. One of the greatest talent scouts of all time was Art Blakey. He had his ear to the ground. He was picking, picking kids out of high school. Uh, a guy with a really bad drug problem and turned some kids on to heroin that, I mean, it deserves to be mentioned as a, as a note against him. But Blakey's absolute drive to further the family tree of jazz is undeniable <clears throat> and his family and musicians that live under those branches is one of the greatest universities in jazz history and for the modern collector who collects the blue notes and the prestiges and the riversides and the impulses as important as the Ellington Count Basie universities are and as big as those uh, branches of players are <clears throat> it's really the Blakey Silver School that is so much of the modern day collector's collection. And when you get past that first tier of players, your Monks, Gillespie's, Coltrane's, uh, Parker's, Miles, Billy Holiday, those are that first round of names you get to know. When you start diving into Blue Note, and the first time you remember I looked up the Blue Note discography, I was like, I don't know who any of these guys are. I mean, there's a few obscure Monk records, a few obscure Miles records, one Coltrane record. Who are all these other guys? And it's just the lion's share of it is the Art Blakey school of guys. Don Bird's great collection of work. I mean, it's just a, a long, long litany of jazz messenger alumni. And each one of those guys also starts bands as, as they moved on from the messengers. Each one of those guys also pushed those guys out into the universe. And so the lineage of the messenger tree it's still felt to this day. There's guys still out there. Wynton Marsalis is a Jazz Messenger alumni. <clears throat> and he's one of the greatest proponents and educators on jazz that's out there today. One of the most eloquent speakers you'll ever hear. And those who criticize Wynton Marsalis for so profoundly pushing the ancient uh, roots of the music. It's because Wynton gets it. I mean, he knows more than you do, guys. Y'all need to sit down and shut up. Wooden Marsalis is part of a great lineage. His father played, he played with Blakey. He knows how important Ellington is. I mean, so many critics aren't really in the place to have an opinion. And part of what being a critic is, is to share what you think about something that you don't know enough about. 
and so many people have criticized Marsalis and some of his uh, stances on jazz canon and jazz history, but I mean, siding with Marsalis is, is a safe bet. The guy knows his stuff, and he is firmly rooted within the branches of, of the jazz canon. So Blakey, I mean, again, Silver, Bird, Mobley, I mean, Morgan, Curtis Fuller, all these guys are just legends. And Blakey's really the founding father of so much of the Blue Note, modern, hard bop sound. And Blakey never compromised. Blakey never felt the need to follow the newest trends and delve into free jazz or the avant-garde or the modal or... I mean, he didn't really delve too deeply into any of the fusion crossover stuff. I mean, there's a few modal pieces like Wayne Shorter, another alumni, brought to the group. But modal, <clears throat> I mean, Blakey's really about drive. He's really about black church, the gospel, the blues, and aggression and tenacity and grit and soul and spirit and overcoming the struggle of tyranny. Blakey's music is just evocative of <clears throat> fighting through fighting through all the, the storm the, the the winds and the hail and the rain that's pelting you in the face when you listen to Blakey you're pushing through that as as they once were and I think Blakey's a, a place in this list is unassailable I just think he's such an important figure and I mean Horace Silver again it's kind of asterisks right there next to him because uh, Silver uh, Blakey Messengers split fairly early and I think by 55, 56 after that great first albums together Silver goes his own way and takes uh, Mobley and, and Bird and Watkins with him and I mean it's just really uh, almost the second tree the Horace Silver uh, universe but uh, moving on Number eight on this list is Ornette Coleman. And some people might say he should be higher. Some people might say he shouldn't even be on this list. But I think Ornette Coleman's uh, contribution to jazz is really uh, pretty clear. And his abandonment of much of the rigidity of what came before. Yet he's also often, I think, incorrectly, he hated the term free jazz initially. He didn't feel like well, that's what they were really doing. And even though he ends up naming one of his albums on Atlantic Free Jazz, which is actually quite difficult to listen, uh, I do like Freddie Hubbard on that quite a lot, but his stuff, it is challenging at times. There's some of his music that's very beautiful and very lyrical. His early contemporary work and his early Atlantic stuff is really important parts of the jazz canon and even his 70s work it's it's really seminal important stuff and his impact and again he's probably one of the greatest polarizing figures in jazz as much as parker and bebop kind of polarized to some degree the old cats from the younger cats i think Col coleman's uh innovations and polarizations really divided jazz <clears throat> almost in an inseparable unrecoverable way and I don't think I've ever read old jazz greats talking about Parker the way some of the old jazz greats talked about Ornette and Ornette's stuff could be quite frenetic and quite uh, dissonant and difficult and uh, lacking melodic structure and but I think that was part of the exploration it was also a sign of the times. It's a, it's a very much a mirror on 5960 America and the political conflicts that were arising, the social conflicts that were arising, the fear of the post-war, Cold War, and the drafting of young black Americans to serve and die for wars when they didn't have freedom themselves. There's a frenetic pace to post-war America and how technologies are developing that the Coleman band seems to really embody a lot of that change, that pace. Even the names of the titles, Change of the Century. I mean, it's, it, it just, it's really a precursor to much of what's to come in jazz in the 60s and 70s. And so as being one of the most popular parts of the jazz canon for people to collect today, Ornette's impact is really quite large. And again, a lot of the old guard didn't really get or appreciate what Ornette was doing. And 
I'm not going to say I listen to Ornette too frequently anymore. There was a time I listened to Ornette a lot more, but he certainly has fallen into uh, less of my listening patterns. I still listen to the early stuff more than anything else, and the later, more frenetic stuff, I hardly, but I hardly ever play Coltrane's frenetic stuff either, to be honest. It's just not something that, A, fits in the coffee shop, but B, it's also just not where my mindset is very often. When I was a young 24-year-old, filled with rebellion and filled with uh, confusion and filled with uh, aggression and filled with spiritual uncertainty, that music really matched a lot of my wit and, and melded with a lot of my consciousness. I'm just not in that mindset very often today. And that's part of, I think, growing up and maturing. And obviously music is the soundtrack to your life. So the music you're listening to should match the moment you're living in. And the frenetic pace and pulse and dissonance, it's just not something I can get into very often nowadays. I like melody to reassure. I like the blues to give me some gut. I like rift and, and groove to give me pattern and foot tapping. I want to just kind of be doing a little bit of that. And it's the same for Frank Zappa's music. I used to love Frank Zappa's music when I was 24. Uh, the psychedelic Grateful Dead stuff. I used to love listening to Live Dead. And that's it for the other one. And the, the early Anthem of the Sun stuff. But now it's the Dead. I want to hear Working Man's Dead. I want to hear American Beauty. I want to hear uh, Bertha and Mama Tried, the great Merle Haggard song. I, I'm a huge Dead fan. I, one of the few rock bands I never really have tired of is the dead because it's never static like jazz it's always new it's always different you never know exactly how they're going to perform on a given night and so i just have really come to love i mean china cat sunflower uh the way they bring in american roots music they're such an important part of americana uh <clears throat> but again the, the more avant-garde psychedelic stuff i really have that propulsion in me at this point in my life i'm not sitting around doing a strip of LSD and drinking a bottle of Jagermeister and uh, smoking weed all fucking day and want to go listen to some space out jams. Just don't get into that mindset very often. So, I mean, there was a time and a place, but it was a younger man and a younger day. So Ornette's pretty firmly at number eight. And again, these numbers are so interchangeable. I just think these are the next five guys in that canon that really deserve all collectors' attention. Number nine on this list is John Coltrane. And it, Coltrane and number 10 on this list really are interchangeable to me in some ways. But Coltrane's popularity, like Miles, deserves a ton of recognition. Uh, Coltrane's innovations are really profound, but I'm not sure they were really necessarily super copied. I'm not sure there's a lot of guys out there trying to redo giant steps. I'm not sure you've ever heard anybody else saying they were playing sheets of sound like Coltrane was in 57. So, I mean, so much of what Coltrane did was a singular journey. And obviously, Ornette Coleman's impact on Coltrane was profound. And when you listen to some of Coltrane's 65, 66 work, it's some hard to listen to difficult exercising a demons kind of stuff. Ascension, uh, Kula Said Mama, Ohm, uh, they're spiritual, they're, they're profound, they're prophetic. They're sincere, and the sincerity of Coltrane is the one thing that always allows me to go to those records and get, to glean something from them. I always will graft myself onto sincerity. Whether it's Bob Dylan or John Lennon or John Coltrane, I mean, Neil Young, I love sincerity. Bob Marley, give me something sincere. Come from the heart, speak from your soul. Give me that legitimate expression of your soul's condition. I connect with that. Ego and virtuosity, yawn fucking boring don't give a fuck how talented you are talent should only be a byproduct of your soul speaking and the obsession you have to perform because your soul needs to speak and that's what separates so much of the late jazz to me and i don't want to speak out of turn here but a lot of the ecm stuff that people laud so greatly it feels like it's very much driven by egotistical look at me kind of players for all the people who love John McLaughlin, it's never connected with me because it doesn't have soul to it from my ears. And I've not heard all of John McLaughlin's work. But my Vishnu Orchestra, Birds of Fire, I thought, I can't play it. 
I've tried numerous times. And even uh, McLaughlin's work with Miles, it's like, that whole era, it's just so much less about, and again, being a white player diminishes how much soul you have on some level because your struggle is so much less and so much less intense. And that's not to say we as white people don't have struggle because boy, we do. We have plenty of depression and anxiety and stress and tyranny and alcohol addiction and drugs and women. I mean, so we have struggle. It's just not the piano over my head, am I going to get shot today by the police kind of struggle. And so it speaks from a different tonality. But, I mean, Train's impact on jazz, his spirituality, I think a lot of spiritual jazz is rooted in, in, and all jazz is spiritual. Let's be clear about that especially all African-American, all black jazz. It's a spiritual phenomenon. It's the old, the old African mask that I talked about many times. The shaman, witch doctor who carved that mask, his intent was never to be the greatest carver in history. I'm not trying to set up to be, look at me, how great a carver I am. His intent was only and purely, I want to be the best protector of myself and my village from the evil spirits at night. And by virtue of carving many masks to be a great protector, I thusly became a great carver. But the virtuosity is a byproduct of the spiritual intent. And the great jazz players of the 40s, 50s, into the 60s, the spirituality, the, the soul, the expression of consciousness and spirit and determination to, to survive, that's what fueled them playing 8, 10, 12 hours a day, which led to virtuosity. The virtuosity is a byproduct. It's never the intent. Anybody who sets out to innovate or sets out to be the greatest has ego driving that vehicle and yawn fucking yawn. I mean, <clears throat> for all the greatness of a guy like Steve I or Angvi Malmsteen or all those great virtuosos in, in the music, a lot of it just does nothing for me at all. And it's the same with the jazz guys from the 70s and 80s. I will say Eddie Van Halen. And even Randy Rose to a degree, but Randy Van Halen, that guy, for all his virtuosity, he's got some soul and some. He's he's a great as great a riff writer as he is a soloist. Which a lot of the great players aren't great songwriters. A lot of the great songwriters aren't great players. Van Halen did both. His riffs are fantastic, and his playing was so innovative and original. But again, a bit like Parker, it feels like a natural thing from him just playing and finding joy in his playing and finding new avenues to run down. I don't think the hammering was him sitting down going, I'm going to reinvent guitar. I don't think Hendrix was trying to reinvent guitar. It just happens. And when it's a byproduct of spirituality and not ego, it's so much more compelling. For me, anyway. <clears throat> so again, Train's great contribution is that integrity and that spirituality and that absolute sincerity. No matter what he was doing, he had his eyes closed with purpose and intent, interceding on behalf of all mankind through the cosmos. And the spiritual and social journey that he goes on is at the cutting edge of the civil rights movement. It's leading the way a love supreme is a global statement of human spirituality. It's not about atonement to one religion or to one philosophy. It's let's find a new human consciousness, a new human spirituality, and let's all try to live in that. And that's a very honorable and noble cause. And no one in jazz quite gets as deep into that quicksand as Coltrane does during the 60s. He really jumps into the human fray. And, I mean, you could say Ellington spoke for all humanity, but he's always speaking for African Americans. And he always, Armstrong was trying to bridge the, be, the, the gap racially, but he was still kind of very much an African. Coltrane really moves beyond race and becomes a human trying to push the envelope for all humanity. His playing, of course, is frenetic and almost overplayed at times. There's times where you're like, geez, train. I mean, there's some stuff even with Miles where he just goes on and on and on with endless ideas. And it's like, it's like a prayer that never ends which provides great contrast to the minimalism of Miles, which is partly why that yin and yang of Miles and Coltrane was so powerful. Is you had one guy saying four notes, another guy saying 40,000 notes. But uh, there's times where, he, I mean, and critics have said this, there's times where it feels like he's overplaying. <clears throat> he just has so many ideas flowing out of him. And a lot of that's also from endless rehearsing, endless playing, endless 
It's not even practice. It's 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 healing. It's a place of solace. It's a, it's a place of comfort. It's a necessity. Rollins and crawl on that bridge to become a great player. Rollins called up in that bridge to play because it was a place where he felt safety, a place of refuge, a place of solace. And when the music's providing that for you, virtuosity just becomes a byproduct of all that engrossing, enveloping time spent with your whore. So again, Train's such an important figure. Uh, a lot of his records sold really well. Uh, my favorite things, the, the Ellington record is just a gorgeous piece of absolutely beautiful, masterful work. I love his, some of his impulse work, uh, especially the softer stuff with Johnny Hartman, ballads, Ellington. Those records are just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Train's early work, it's a man developing, you know, and Train's later work is very challenging. But when Train is in a certain place, he's absolutely one of the greatest, and he's one of the greatest of all time, no matter what you're listening to. And his, like I said, his conviction will always help carry the day. And then number 10 on this list, and I struggle putting him ahead or after Train, but his popularity today is less than Train, but Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins was the great innovator of the tenor saxophone. And of course, Coleman Hawkins owes a great debt to Louis Armstrong. And it was playing with Louis Armstrong and Fletcher Henderson in the late 20s in that orchestra in New York that opens up the, the great uh, ideas of <clears throat> what Coleman Hawkins develops on the tenor saxophone. But he absolutely changes the face of the tenor saxophone and brings it into the limelight and the spotlight. And then with Coleman Hawkins, you really have to mention Lester Young, uh, the president. Lester Young was also one of the most beautiful players. And then you can't mention those two without mentioning Ben Webster. That triumvirate of great tenor players really shaped the sound of the tenor saxophone for the next generation of Lucky Thompsons and Dexter Gordons. And then for the next generation after that of the Sidney Rollins and John Coltrane's. <clears throat> so, I mean, Coleman Hawkins is such a beautiful player. He's at the forefront of all the innovations in jazz. Body and Soul, when he records that in 39 for RCA, I don't think it was actually for RCA, but RCA ended up owning it. I mean, it's really the, when a, a progenitor of bebop. He's playing off the melody from the very beginning of that song. It's a very unique take on Body and Soul. And then it's, uh, it's a really incredible take. And when the Civil Rights Movement comes along, uh, he's working on some of the most difficult records. Freedom Now, uh, we insist with, I mean, Abby Lincoln and, and, and Max Roach, and some of those really powerful social development. Coleman Hawkins is on those records. Hawkins is there for bebop. He's there for the hard bop. He's there for the, the ballads and the blues. He's, he's, he's black church. Coleman Hawkins is such an important figure and is worthy of all the recognition in the world. So that's my next five. Uh, Clifford Brown, R. Blakey, Annette Coleman, John Coltrane, and Coleman Hawkins, with again, honorable mention of Horace Silver, Count Basie, Lester Young, Ben Webster. Uh, but there's that list is endless. And again, lists aren't really that important. It's just a great way to talk about these guys. Y'all have a great day. We'll talk to y'all soon. Please help support the channel. Please help support the coffee shop. If you want merchandise, message me or go to the link in the, in the description below. I have some different merchandise here in the cafe. If you want some of that, I can send it to you via PayPal if you want to have some, uh, some cool stuff. So y'all be safe. We'll talk to y'all soon. Have a great day. Peace.